Hello, everybody. If I could have your attention, please. Um, hi, I'm here uh, with the honor of introducing Dr. Sean McKittrick to you today. Um, he is our Middle States um, Commissioner who's here in an advisory role for us today. And he is going to talk about the process of Middle States. And then at the end, he's going to introduce um, the opportunity to ask questions of him. Uh, Dr. McKittrick is an assessment expert. He came to Middle States from Binghamton University. And um, so I look forward to an informative discussion. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McKittrick. This is an interesting microphone. It's a little thing in front of it. I, I won't spit, I promise. Um, I feel a bit at home because I'm a SUNY person, or, or was once before I came to the commission about a year ago at Binghamton. So um, it's always a pleasure to come out to, um, uh, to uh, an institution connected with the SUNY system. Um, you were about to engage in self-study. And one thing that an institution must um, submit to me is a self-study design. By a show of hands, has anyone here had anything to do with self-study design or know what it is? So, yeah, a fair number of you. That's great. And it was a, it was a good document. Um, the self-study design's purpose is to really give you a chance to study yourself. Um, the accreditation process is such that um, regional accreditors require institutions not only to look at themselves, but obviously to comply uh, with certain standards. So half of our process in self-study is to demonstrate compliance. And half of the process in self-study is to answer questions that you would like to ask of, of yourself as an institutional community so that it can assist you in the future. Ideally, we want the self-study to be a document that will serve you at least in the next five years after it is submitted. And the team report, when the team comes in and issues its report, we, I, it is our ideal that that team report also serve you for the next five to 10 years. We, um, every so often we get visits uh, from officials from ministries of education uh, in, in um, Europe or in Asia, um, areas um, that have this ministry system, you know, a department of education basically, but an institution may only operate through the ministry. And what they tell us is that w what appeals them to the accreditation process in the United States is that it is not a checkoff process or just an audit. Yeah, an audit's part of it. A finance reviewer is going to be on this team and, and look through the books and be an auditor to, to affirm compliance with our finance standards. But um, they tell us that internationally, which what often happens is the department comes in, audits a bunch of stuff, writes a report, and sometimes they feel that it's a very political process. Now, as a political scientist, I will tell you there's no such thing as an apolitical process, but still, the, um, they attest to the fact that what they would prefer is a process that exists in the United States which combines compliance with a peer review function. That is, that people write things like a self-study, an institution writes some sort of document like that, and they bring experts in to look at the quality of the institution with regard to specific standards. And we've heard many times people say, that the secret of quality, the secret to why the United States in the past has performed so well in the higher uh, education arena has a lot to do with self-regulation and peer review. The mission statement, part of the mission statement of the Middle States Commission 
on higher education, if you go on to her web, website, uses terms such as peer evaluation, continuous quality improvement, those sorts of things, because we do feel that peer evaluation will engender public confidence in the mission as we know to be, uh, the mission as it relates to uh, higher education in the United States. So if you have taken a look at our webpage, which I encourage all of you to do, go to our mission and vision statements and to our strategic plan, and you will find that we really do very much believe, the commissioners believe it, the vice presidents believe it, the staff believe it, that through peer review, institutions become even better than they are now. And we are seeing so many terrific examples of institutions using the standards, which really are minimum expectations of what depicts um, a, an institution of quality. They've taken these standards and made them their own and then added other stuff to it that is um, other things that are reflective of their mission. Another thing that is important to the Middle States Commission and is relevant to this process is that an institution's mission is of paramount performance, um, perform, paramount importance. I'll get to the performance piece later. If institutions are not allowed to have unique missions, then it becomes increasingly difficult in the policy arena to deliver a tailored education to students who need to pursue their dreams and to pursue different aspects of what they feel um, is important. So if you go to our, our website, you'll find a lot of language having to do with mission. We expect all of our institutions, we accredit somewhere around 520 or 530 institutions um, to have a mission and to demonstrate that, it, that each institution is meeting its mission. Now, a couple of documents to look at as you prepare for the self-study process, all of which are on our website, so I'm not selling anything has our, the Characteristics of Excellence, which is our document which contains the requirements of affiliation and the 14 separate standards. You may wanna look at the Team Visits Guide. You may wanna look at the Self-Study Guide. And you may wanna look at our very um, voluminous list of policies that institutions are required to follow to become familiar with the process. All of these will tell you that while the accreditation process can be involved, we give you, I think, very clear directions on how to demonstrate compliance. The characteristics of excellence themselves have reference in U.S. Department of Education guidelines. Do a Google search, type in U.S. Department of Education guidelines accreditation and probably in the first five or so links, you'll find the document that, um, that contains guidelines for regional accreditors and other accreditors and, and lists of what we need to require of our institutions. So almost literally, some of the fundamental elements are lifted from that document. Call us plagiarizers if you want but we figure it's easier for us to copy and paste and be very clear about what the federal government requires than to just add or delete from the language. So many of the fundamental elements, I would say 80, 90% of them, have to do with US Department of Education guidelines. And some of them, of the fundamental elements, have to do with what our member institutions feel should be minimum expectations of, their, of, of one another. So it's important to look at the characteristics and think of them as minimum expectations of what the United States Department of Education wants, 
but also minimum ex expectations of what the 530, 540, I can't remember the exact count right now, um, what our member institutions require of one another. So the characteristics of excellence, you may note if you've had ch a chance to refer to them, have 14 specific standards, all of which have reference in the federal guidelines. The first standard has to do with mission and goals. An institution is expected to have a clear and distinct mission and to have goals that help it to uh, make decisions. Standard two has to do with resource allocation decisions and planning. That is that an institution uses assessment and other um, evaluation mechanisms to make decisions and to engage in resource allocation decisions. Three is the standard on resources, which is finance, that an institution has adequate controls in place to ensure that you know students won't show up one day and see the whole place padlocked, something like that. Standards four and five have to do with governance and administration, the quality thereof, and, and whether they have um, some of the fundamental elements refer to things such as conflict of interest policies and different policies that are in place. Standard six has to do with integrity. So fundamental elements having to do with, does the institution comply with the Federal, Federal Clery Act? Does the institution represent itself in ways that are reasonably accurate and truthful in the eyes of students, parents, and, and other important constituencies? Standard seven is institutional assessment, which is the wide assessment standard saying that, a student, uh, that an institution must demonstrate that it regularly engages in assessment activity on specific goals, also called the institutional effectiveness standard. Basically, an institution has to demonstrate that it's effective in, in more or less objective means. Standards eight and nine have to do with retention, graduation, and student support. Uh, they have to do with the idea of having fair and legitimate admissions practices, have to do with support of students who may not, um, who may not have the means, even the physical abilities to come to campus. Americans for Disabilities Act, those sorts of things are implied in these standards. Um, that the institution has retention and graduation rate strategies to increase those graduation and retention rates and so forth. Standard 10 has to do with faculty, that the institution has qualified faculty that are engaged in the teaching and learning and administrative processes. Standard 11 is your educational offerings, your majors, the things that students graduate with, be it medical technology, be it political science, be it whatever degree um, that, it, that, that is involved. Standard 12 is general education. That's, there's a, most institutions have a breadth requirement. Students have to take writing and those sorts of courses. That is that the standards are consonant with what would be expected of higher education and that it is appropriately assessed. Standard 13 is called related educational offerings, meaning remedial education, prior learning assessment, that if you have additional locations that they are adequately um, resourced and so forth. And finally, standard 14, student learning assessment, that faculty um, and uh, other principal parties gather, they have identified student learning outcomes, that they use direct assessments of student learning to identify strengths and weaknesses in student learning that they have opportunities on a periodic basis to talk about those strengths and weaknesses and to make recommendations and that faculty then use that information in things such as lesson planning, curriculum choices, uh, those sorts of things. Each of these standards has an assessment component attached to it. Um, so the expectation of the commission is that uh, in demonstrating compliance with the standard, an institution just can't say, 
yeah, we do it, now leave us alone. Uh, an institution can't just describe it, but they also need to evaluate uh, their compliance and demonstrate through some objective means, if, if applicable, that um, it is compliant um, with the standards. So that's my long laundry list of 14 standards. Um, the requirements of affiliation are really easy. The institution has money. Everyone speaks English so they can communicate with the um, commission, um, that, that sort of thing. thing. That there are actually faculty here, um, really easy things. Although I said in another meeting, um, I'm, I'm not serious about this, but sometimes I think we should cite institutions on the requirement of affiliation on speaking and communicating in English because you should see some of the self-studies I read. Um, but, but we wouldn't go there. I don't think the commission would approve of that. The commission itself is constituted of around 24 commissioners. These commissioners come from institutions such as your own. We have commissioners and members of the executive team uh, of the executive um, council coming from community colleges, private institutions, some institutions that are represented, Montgomery Community College, Princeton University, Empire State. Um, we have commissioners from um, um, West Point. We have commissioners from many, many different types of institutions whose job it is to make determinations about the institution's compliance. So as your institutional liaison and as a vice president with the commission, I have no vote. I don't speak at the meetings unless spoken to. I'm not Amish, but that is the deal. And my job is to support you through this process and to answer questions so that we can move toward a successful team. Now, I'm going to answer a question anticipating that nobody wants to ask it, and that is, um, what are the range of actions? I mean, what happens after a team comes to visit us? Um, the range of actions, you know, the majority of our institutions are granted accreditation. Anywhere between 50 and 70 percent of our institutions have some sort of follow-up action in the form of a progress report to the commission or something of that sort. So it's never a bad thing to have a progress report. I think I'm actually, I, I actually think it's a good thing when an institution has a progress report for this reason alone, and that is if an institution completes a progress report, it won't be surprised five years later when it has to report on something um, and it doesn't know what to report on because it hasn't been asked to do so. But a progress report often is often required, a monitoring report, um, there are follow-up actions that sometimes that, that do um, actually often occur, but the purpose of uh, the commission is simply to assist the, the institutions in um, being compliant with federal regulations, to assist institutions in being compliant with the commission's own standards, uh, so that the public has enough confidence in our institutions to. Um, continue to invest in education, to continue to send th their students to our institutions, and those sorts of things. So while you may think that I stand here in my Darth Vader costume, the truth is that I'm here to support you during this process and to answer questions about the standards so that um, you can continue to do what you do so very well. I've had a number of meetings on campus this morning. You are a very, in a very enviable position. Your graduation rate, rate looks good. I looked at the IPEDS comparative data from that the U.S. Department of Ed provides. Um, you're in an enviable position with regard to um, things such as a graduate. You may think they're low, but if you are in my position and you visit other community colleges, um, you're not bad. Um, you have a very, very good administration. You have a very supportive board. And um, it just seems to be a very, very good institution, both objectively looking at the information 
and looking at some of the objective statistics that I look at, but also based on conversations. You know, it's easy for me, as I say, to parachute in for four hours and leave and, and, and to tell you what I think. But based upon the objective information I see, it just sees, uh, it, it just seems to me that you are in a very, very good position uh, to begin to engage in, in self-study. So I hope that when the team comes, we will select a chair. Um, the commission will choose a chairperson for you. Um, after consulting with uh, your steering committee, the board, and the president, I've already had some really good um, ideas about the qualities to see in a chairperson. We're not going to choose the provost of Columbia. We're not going to choose the president or the commandant of West Point because these institutions are so different from yours. It would be very unfair to have somebody bring a background that is so different to play that role as chairperson. And no, they can't come from New York. I mean, yeah, they can't come from New York State. So my job is to recruit a chairperson who will be able to facilitate objective and fair review, but also who has the appropriate background to really be sensitive to your mission uh, so that they can give you really good advice. The team report will contain section, a section called suggestions, and you want lots of these suggestions. They're non-binding. They don't have to be reported on. Mm -hmm. You can choose to adopt them or not. But we spend a lot of time in the commission recruiting people who are, are from your in, uh, institutions like yours, who have been in this business for a while, hopefully, who can come, ask questions, read your self-study, um, all of that sort of thing, um, so that they can make good suggestions for you. So um, we are hopeful that that team report will be useful to you. Um, and so I, I'm very, very hopeful that we'll have um, a, a very good process. So now, that said, what questions do you have for me? Don't all stall, start at once. Um, I know that there's a long, long line, but I only visit a campus once every 10 years, so, um, you know, to, to kick off the self-study process, unless, you know, there's some commission business that I need to uh, attend to. So what questions do you have for me about any of the standards, um, mission, um, resource allocation decisions, student learning assessment, institutional assessment? What questions do you have for me? Yes, ma'am. So I think you've read our, our mission. I'm just curious what, what, you, what you think of our, our mission, because you said you started to say how important that was, and that it's from that perspective of this is in a lot of the kind of thing that you're looking at without going to multiple college sites and looking at, at many missions. So right, right. Yeah, I'll sit here with the internet, you know, yeah. looking everything up as you're talking. Um, no, I think the mission statement is quite quite good. Uh, this is going to sound um, a little odd. I, I think that it is um, typical of a community college. And I know we say that uh, mission statements need to be unique. However, um, it very much reads as though you're a community college. You wouldn't believe this, but sometimes I read mission statements, and I really can't tell the difference between their mission statements um, and their strategic plans and the mission statement and strategic plan for Boeing. I mean, it's so generic as to be unbelievable. And I'm not commenting on Boeing's strategic plan. It was actually very well written. It does have the word airplanes in it. <laughs> but um, I think it's very, very well done, especially since it mentions things such as transfer, uses terms such as transfer, occupational and technical, certificate programs, and the institution is brave for using the term lifelong learning, which is um, coming over the horizon. Institutions are beginning to, well, the public is expecting our institutions to inculcate within our students a love for lifelong learning. So it has the elements in it that I think are really, really good. It, it both shows some distinction 
It does mention some of the things that, having read a lot about Duchess, that I would expect to be an admission. But also I can read that there's a community college, that it's a community college with the typical issues of transfer and occupational technical degrees and that sort of thing. That's a long answer, but. Take it then to the, the next step, which is, you know, along with the mission come the institutional goals. Um, so, so how about, how about those? Because uh, it's a pretty long list and I just, you know, relative to other, other schools or what, I think it's, it's, it's quite on target. I mean, this list, and then you have the college values, that's what you're referring to in the steering. You can't see them from here. No, I know exactly what you mean. Um, <laughs> I want to go through where the college values fit in with that, you know, because it's really the mission and the institutional goals and the college values. Maybe you could enlighten us on that, like where that fits in to, to well, how they I, report to you. I would hope, and I think this is true, that the objectives and the goals that I see on page th three and four um, are linked to your strategic plan. I I'm pretty sure they are. And so the first thing I think of when I think of institutional goals is I, I wonder about the institution's strategic plan in general. Because when I read institutional goals, if it is important to be an institutional goal, then I would expect these things to be addressed somewhere. Right? If it's important enough to, it's like in student learning assessment. If a department says in this, um, in this program, we expect students to graduate with an understanding of various religious backgrounds and cultures, and then there's nothing in the curriculum having to do with, relig uh, with um, religion and culture, then something's wrong with the curriculum, right? Some, some, I mean, there's no way students can deliver on those expectations because there's no courses in the middle. So when I look at the institutional goals and, and knowing a bit about your strategic planning approach, it looks fine to me. Um, and no, it doesn't look too long. Actually, I worry more about institutions that have two, like three institutional goals. And then I wonder, that's, that's it? <laughs> and these are pretty specific, which leads me to believe that a lot of thought has been put into this. These don't look generic to me. I mean, they look familiar to somebody, I, I, I would think somebody who's at a community college, these look familiar, but I, it looks like a lot of thought has been put into it. Um, um, and by the way, I'm so happy that you put the L word in your objectives, you know, learning. Um, <laughs> you, you wouldn't believe how many times I see institutional goals and in learning, and there's lots about stadiums, revenue, human resource stuff, governing boards, fantastic stuff, but there's just not, not a thing in there about student learning. And here I do see it. So, yeah, you're, you pass. <laughs> you're, 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 I think it's good. It looks good to me. Other questions? That was a long answer, sorry. What, no questions about student learning assessment? Oh, there's a pin drop there. What questions do you have about standard 14 student learning assessment? Okay, yes ma'am. <laughs> um, so for uh, assessment, uh, uh, student learning at the institutional level. I picture, you know, they have institutional level learning outcomes, and then you need to provide evidence, and students are, are meeting that. Um, it would be typical for a school to have identified like a general education core requirement, um, and even to be honest, like call it that. And, and, and we kind of have, we kind of don't, but it's not like crystal clear. Um, how we, we don't deal with it as a program, let's say. Um, so I'm wondering, in, in looking at um, other colleges, what's the spectrum of things that you see um, that, that are working and not working? Because it helps with your goals yeah. uh, as far as assessing those uh, institutional level student learning outcomes. Sure. Institutional level is oftentimes used as gen ed. Is that 
or are you including anything else in that? It's, it's, it's a, a bunch of them, I bet. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I, it's, like I said, it, it's not that we have clearly defined a gen ed program. We okay. don't have anything specifically that's general education program. We have courses specifically that every student has to take. Okay. So the, the commission's expectation is for, um, for, for student learning assessment and how it's related to gen ed is this. There must be student learning outcomes. The state, there need to be written out student learning outcomes in general education. So, you know, for things like writing, um, th those sorts of things that we would expect in general education. And then there need to be assessments, meaning that there are um, periodic episodes in which the institution looks at, at student work and evaluates strengths and weaknesses with regard to each learning outcome. That's not enough though, because one can just use a standardized test, I guess, and, and you know, kind of be done with it. There needs to be alignment, but what the commission also expects is that faculty get together and they look at this information and they say, what are, in our opinion, what, what in our opinion are the strengths and weaknesses as we observe them as a result of looking at this assessment information. What recommendations do we want to make um, of ourselves or otherwise to help to enhance performance or to either even continue excellent performance? And then an institution needs to demonstrate that it is um, acting on those recommendations, that it has done something. That's also true in all majors and programs, but in institutional outcomes, uh, gen ed in particular, that is certainly required. Now, where some institutions are um, falling down a little bit is some institutions do too much, actually. So what they do is they assess every, every outcome in every part of gen ed every semester and when the team gets there, they've never had an opportunity to put this together and summarize what strengths and weaknesses exist. They're sort of constantly collecting data, but it's so much that they don't get to the conversation piece and identifying recommendations. So that's one area weakness of some institutions. On the other side, um, we still have institutions. I mean, we've had assessment in the standard since 1956, and yet we still have institutions that say that they don't have learning outcomes. Um, that would be a way to go on warning. Um, <laughs> I mean, the assessment can't happen if there aren't learning outcomes. So, I mean, the very basis of knowing how students are doing doesn't exist, so that would be a problem. Thankfully, it's a that's just such a minority anymore. Um, so we have two extremes happening with institutions that are experiencing some weakness in gen ed assessment. Where institutions are doing quite well, and we're seeing some really, really fantastic examples, is that they're simply listing the learning outcomes having conversations about efficient ways that they can directly assess these things, and then having the conversations and acting on them. So one campus, what they do is ever, in, in writing, um, they collect samples of student work over a two or three year period, take a random sample from that, um, ask some instructors to get together and take a rubric after they're trained for an hour or so at a luncheon that they have, um, and then they grade uh, the papers. Um, and then their IR person types the results in and on the element of each rubric, those are the scores. But what's interesting is that they not only use a quantitative approach, but they take these rate graders out to lunch again and they say, let's talk about the learning outcomes. Tell me where you have found some strengths and weaknesses, even beyond what the elements in the rubric say. 
and that results in a report that's given to the curriculum committee to discuss for recommendations and communication to the wider university audience. And they do it once every three years. I mean, it's, it's literally, um, it takes maybe the IR office uh, 10 to 20 hours every three years. It takes um, the faculty some total, um, each member, there's three members of the committee, three or four, I think it took them something like eight hours to go through the papers. And a committee met um, the, the luncheon, add the luncheons two hours to that. Uh, the curriculum committee met for two hours. So if you add it all up, everyone involved, it was something like 40 hours every three years on, on one area. And what they swear to is that the qualitative and the quantitative piece is they interact so well that it's just the discussions about what to do are sort of natural. It just leads to recommendations and discussions amongst the faculty. Other really good approaches, some, some colleges are using um, software like TrackDat or some of the other things, on this, um, and some are doing very well with that. Others aren't because they can't figure out the technology. <laughs> that would be me, by the way. Um, I, I'm not a technology person, so that would not be me uh, who, who would be able to understand all of this. Um, other campuses are using um, course portfolios in which they collect um, statements of strengths and weaknesses in student learning with some quantitative data over a couple of years, then have a committee look at it and then make recommendations and then work with the faculty, the broader faculty. I mean, there are a lot of practices. I even had one community college in, in Maryland that they, they do this rubric thing and they even have an avatar. <laughs> and the avatar is sent to the faculty, it's called an assessment minute by email and they can see what the results are and then the faculty are asked in department meetings or otherwise to write down what they see as strengths and weaknesses and what in their courses they feel they want to do about it. And then every so often they'll meet in committee to talk about any other suggestions they might make. But the bottom line is where it's done really well is as an endemic process. It becomes a sort of is endemic to uh, department meetings and to other things. Um, one campus that did not do well had one of their larger departments tell me that, actually they did pretty well, but this department was really a problem for them. They said, well, we haven't met for 10 years, why would we start now? Well, I would say that's a problem with standard 10 faculty as well as a problem with student learning assessment. Um, but it's endemic to the process. It can be both qualitative and quantitative with take, and they ratchet down the pressure by making it discussion oriented with somebody who's um, working through the process. Has anyone read the book Assessment Made Easy by Barbara Walvoord? It's a terrific document in which she says, if you want these conversations to work, um, list your student learning outcomes on a piece of paper, then create three columns, proficient, not so for proficient, not very proficient. Go through, a, through a list, of, go through a stack of papers and put check marks, you know, under each learning outcome that applies, and then look at the pattern of the check marks and see where your students are weak and where they're strong and just have your conversation. Maybe a little lazy, it sounds a little lazy, Barbara Walver is not a lazy person, um, but what she was saying is, and, and where campuses are doing very well, is they have a process where they have identified learning outcomes, they know what to look, look at, what samples a student work or what to observe in order to um, determine what strengths and weaknesses exist. Uh, before I joined the commission, I was consulting with a um, art school and they thought they weren't doing assessment. They were in, you know, they had some issues with assessment and they thought they weren't doing it, but they had like a graduation show 
where they already had a rubric. What they did is they gave art professionals who would come from the city to visit, and they would evaluate each senior's work of art, um, and then they'd fill out you know, a little scorecard to give that, that student some feedback. Um, they were doing assessments. What they may not have realized that they were doing is, that, yeah, they actually counted <laughs> you, you know, the number of students who were highly proficient, proficient, not so proficient on each learning outcome for the program as exhibited through their work. The only thing they weren't doing was they weren't getting together as a faculty and talking about the results and making recommendations in a formal way. Um, it was endemic. They were already doing it. I, in fact, I was shocked that they were even paying me to be a consultant because I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do is say, look, <laughs> you have these graduation shows. You have this scorecard, which looks like a rubric to me. Put, aggregate it, count, and see, generally speaking, where your students are strong or weak and do it every, after every graduation show. So, and it was an incredibly good practice. I mean, after a while, they started doing that, and they were really having some good conversations about um, some opportunities to enhance student performance. So there's a lot of different examples out there, depending on the discipline, depending on, um, on um, the structure of the curriculum and those sorts of things. What they did is they identified, now this is a four-year institution, they identified 300 level courses, the instructors um, submitted the papers, and then what the um, uh, person administering the assessment did was in consultation with their rubric evaluators, they sampled out some things that clearly did not apply to the writing prompt and to the rubric. Sometimes you'd run into a course and it was a lab report. You, you, can't, you can't really evaluate writing very well on the lab reports. Those were extracted. And then they extracted all the papers of the sophomores and juniors and only took the papers of the seniors. And then proceeded to the rubric exercise. Um, you know, so the writing is a general education objective. And in their general education program, they certainly had you know, college writing as a they weren't taking the papers out of that course. Well, there are not any specific, there were writing courses at the 100 level at the institution, but they didn't want to take them from that because it, what they really wanted to know is upon graduation, what is the quality of the writing? Yeah. Yeah, and, and so definitely perfection is the enemy of the good in assessment. Uh, Methodologic, I'm, I'm a pretty strict methodologist, but um, there's, it's never going to be perfect. So that's why I always add a qualitative component to it, because it sort of controls for some of the imperfections. But that's a conversation that really has to happen uh, with those who are conducting the exercise. And then I would suggest conduct the exercise once, see what results from it, and then, and then um, refine that process as you go along. Other questions? Yes, sir. Charlie. 
Um, the Commission has no position on that. The position of the Commission is that programs have stated learning outcomes, assessments attached to those, that this information is aggregated, talked about, and recommendations. I know, I, I get what you're talking about. We do expect there to be some integration in the curriculum and people talk to each other and there aren't silos. I mean, that's in the fundamental elements as well. But with regard to what, how to specifically do that, the commission leaves it up to all institutions to decide how to accomplish it. There are many issues, even sub-issues and the things that you mentioned that are, are, can be very complex. So. I guess the, the Commission's main expectation is found in the fundamental elements. The, fa the faculty must have learning outcomes. They must assess those learning outcomes. They must look at the results, talk about them, make recommendations, and show they're doing something about it. Other than that, the Commission is more or less in the weeds, and the Commission does not, is, is loath to go into the weeds of this. Now, I'm not punting other than to say that um, the Commission's expectations are clear in the fundamental elements, how to achieve integration, how to achieve um, sort of collaboration and, and, and that sort of thing between uh, departments is really up to the institution. Um, it's hard for the Commission to create a standard that says this is how an institution is going to achieve integration and how to talk to each other. It expects it to happen, but it's up to the institution to determine um, how it's going to do that efficiently. Uh, well, we, are, we are writing a formula, and then, then institutions will be fill up that formula to uh, check here, check here, check there, and if you work out or not, it doesn't matter. Well, I mean, uh, again, I think uh, the Commission expects simply that the, each academic program and in institutional outcomes that uh, the institution take a systematic approach to evaluating student learning in aggregate. And that's the best the Commission can do on that point. Um, be, otherwise, we'd be telling institutions, we'd get, be getting into your business and telling you what business rules you have to develop for this versus that, and we just don't do that. So it's, di it's difficult to answer. Uh, other than to show you what the standards are and maybe strategize about how to do that. But um, strategies are separate than commission policy. The assessment in other areas in student learning, could you just could you talk a little bit about uh, examples of other types of assessments in other operations that sure. are being done out there? Well, let me start, let me be, be self serving and start with the easy ones. <laughs> Um, student Affairs, for example, uh, NASPA, their organization, has some fairly good expectations with regard to assessment. And student, NASPA, in fact, are any of you members, is this school associated with NASPA? Okay, so you know that NASPA has some, out, they're getting to the point where they even want to have outcomes and that sort of thing. So for student affairs departments, sometimes it's easy for them to kind of look at those outcomes, see where it's mission relevant, and then find ways to assess them. And what many 
uh, student affairs units do is they use focus groups on you know do it every couple of years um, they use um, retention data um, uh, and and they they slice and dice the retention data down to area they use um, survey data um, a survey data is very very good if it involves things such as operations quality of operations behaviors uh, attitudes uh, those sorts of things uh, so student affairs does that libraries are noted very famous for being very well involved in assessment they I've, I've been at uh, schools where they've assessed they've gone through things like they've actually assessed how many times the help desk is asked questions they actually have somebody uh, you know count I, I don't know if I'd go that far but it, it's, it's useful to them um, they use uh, LibQual a survey that of students that assesses their awareness of library resources but the key is in each case that each unit has objectives that they feel that they need to achieve and just like in student learning assessment they assess it in a meaningful way they identify strengths and weaknesses and they use that information to make recommendations and then take action um, even parking offices have gone so far as to evaluate uh, students' opinion of parking. I've, I've, I'm rarely at an institution where students don't complain about parking, by the way, very rare. But, but still, they assess the quality of parking, those sorts of things, and the use of parking spaces and grids. But the bottom line is that each unit has objectives, they assess them, in meaningful ways, identify strengths and weaknesses. It's evidence-based decision-making. But I will say another important piece that the commission expects is that not only that happens, but that it is integrated. So in other words, um, institutions are expected not to operate in silos. The, look for the word integration in the fundamental elements. What is meant by that is you talk to each other. Okay, so student affairs offices are oftentimes find out things about behavioral outcomes that may be relevant to general education outcomes. Student affairs offices oftentimes um, engage students in exercises and assess students in those exercises on attitudes toward diversity, attitudes toward um, um, you know things that we want students to achieve while they're here um, does student affairs share that with the gen ed people it's both efficient but it also shows that there's some integration now don't get me wrong the commission is not saying that student affairs has to use this data point for this department what i'm saying is uh, integration is a very important part of both standard seven and standard two which is resource allocation decisions. And then on top of that, the question is, the institution has a strategic plan, so how are the goals and objectives of the strategic plan, how does that affect decision-making by the units? Okay, so is there integration there? So there's a number of expectations there. Um, but re please remember that the commission is not coming in and saying we expect all institutions to exhibit complete perfection on everything that is in the characteristics of excellence. We expect performance on these. We expect you to be compliant with the fundamental elements, but we also are a bit reasonable on this. Um, we, we need you to meet the fundamental elements, but we also know that stuff happens. So what happens if, um, I don't know, uh, the state of New York de decides to um, half the price of tuition for all community colleges? That could introduce an issue in standard three. The team may cite the institution on it, but the team will also, and the commission will also say, well, it's not as though the institution had a choice in this matter. So we need to take all of that into account. So 
my suggestion in standard seven, in, in unit level assessment and whatever, is to be practical, look at it, and provide documentation. I'll talk to the steering committee about exhibit centers, but you know, provide um, good documentation, examine your processes to demonstrate compliance. I had a hand. Am I, am I out of time? Oh, I have three minutes. I actually have a timer in the audience. There's one in every crowd. I'm joking. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, you had mentioned that standard four and five involve government. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you're looking for, the questions you're looking for in terms of government. The fundamental elements having to do with governance have to do primarily with the governing board, that it has a conflict of interest policy, that it um, is interested in the institution, quite frankly. Um, and that its operations are consistent um, with, um, with the role of a governing board, which is always a sort of general oversight role. Where, where institutions have problems with standard four have to do with, um, well, we had one campus, for example, a governing board was also a state senator who got himself into a $40,000 a year job where he'd show up, um, read a newspaper, and go home and then get his, get his favorite people hired by the institution. That's a direct violation of one of the fundamental elements um, um, in, in standard four. So um, the governance standard looks at a, a, a sort of oversight, general advisory function of the governing board. Um, so it needs to be involved, but it can't be so in the weeds that it gets in the way of decision, of everyday decision making. Someone else raised a hand. Maybe I answered their question. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much.